Hi, I'm Francis Hellier, and welcome to my podcast, Metaverse. This is a podcast for the future-minded, a series for anyone on the hunt for the next big thing and all its possibilities and implications. With each episode, I will chat to those at the top of their fields, from futurists in crypto and space travel to forecasters in business and tech. Together, we'll ask the question, what's next? Today, I'm joined by Michael Lopez Alegria, Chief Astronaut for Axiom Space and Commander of the AX-1 mission. Joining NASA in 1992, Michael is a four-time astronaut. He holds NASA records for the most spacewalks, currently standing at 10, and a cumulative extravehicular activity time of 67 hours and 40 minutes. In 2021, he was inducted into the US Astronaut Hall of Fame. His work on AX-1 leverages his experience in traditional government space exploration to help forge a new era of private human spaceflight. Michael will become the first person to ever command an all private crew mission to the International Space Station, the ISS, as part of Axiom Mission One in 2022. Formerly, Michael was the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation and has served on several advisory boards and committees, including the Human Exploration and Op Operations Committee of the NASA Advisory Council and many more. Michael, uh, as ever, it's a pleasure to meet you and lovely to have you on the show. Good to see you, Francis. Happy to be with you. So I want to start right back at the very beginning. Um, what inspired you to become an astronaut? Well, I was pretty fascinated with uh, NASA and astronauts in the 60s, um, in the height of the Gemini and then later Apollo program. Uh, my mother worked for NASA for a time and would bring home brochures called NASA Facts. And they were mostly about satellites, but a few about human spaceflight. And I really got into it. And, you know, my friend and I, my next door neighbor is my best friend. And I ended up, you know, playing rocket ship, as we called it, in a closet of my bedroom, which had been mocked up to look like some kind of spacecraft. And, um, you know, it, it was just a childhood dream. I have to say that that sort of faded over time. And when I went to uh, what we call high school here in the US and then university, that was not sort of on the radar. And then again, the dream was reborn when I was much older, 25. I, I was a Navy pilot and interested in combining aviation with engineering, which is what test pilots do. It turns out a lot of the early astronauts, my heroes, were graduates of test pilot school. So I got back on track and uh, sort of had that focus ever since. Now, Michael, your first space mission was the STS-73 in 1995. Can you take us back to that first experience? The three things that stand out in, in a space flight, the first is a launch. It's just an incredibly physiologically uh, overwhelming sensation. The, the acceleration is, first of all, pretty high, but mostly it's long. And for eight and a half minutes, you're being accelerated faster than a Formula One car can go from you know, zero to 100 kilometers per hour. So it's pretty impressive. The second is floating, the sensation of being weightless. And you know, it's we've all experienced it, but probably mostly for just a fraction of a second when you jump off a trampoline or a diving board and are suspended when you stop going up and before you start coming down. And then the third and most, I think, impactful for the long term is the view of our planet from orbiting the Earth at about 400 kilometers. It's it's just spectacularly beautiful and no, nothing that you've seen can prepare you for it. I, I saw plenty of pictures and imagery and talked to my colleagues who had gone before me, but uh, seeing it with your own eyes for the first time is quite impactful. A number of people who've uh, been fortunate to be in space have always sort of mentioned the fact that the Earth looks so fragile. And I think that it, it, it definitely probably created a new era of environmentalism, those first images we got from, uh, from space of our, of our fragile planet. Um, did you feel that same connection? Yes, absolutely. You know, the fragility is probably most exemplified by when you look sideways at the limb of the Earth or the horizon, you can see how thin the atmosphere is. You know, when you think of the Earth, being the size of an apple, the skin of that apple is about the thickness of the atmosphere that protects us from everything that's out there, which is not pleasant. And so, yeah, you really do get a sense of connection with uh, not just the earth itself as a planet, but also the people on it. You look down, you don't see borders between countries. Um, you don't see conflict. You don't see famine. You don't see disease. It's uh, It seems like a beautiful, tranquil place. And when you think about 
some of the strife going on all over the world today, it makes you wonder, you know, why. Now, what does it really feel like being in space? And uh, perhaps you could indulge us with um, a little bit of sort of what it's like to be on the ISS, uh, how it feels, the changes you feel in your body, and and how it feels to interact with uh, your colleagues that are, are aboard. Well, it's pretty strange at first, this sensation of floating all the time. You know, it's obviously quite pleasant in a lot of ways. You let go of something and it doesn't fall to the floor. It just hovers in front of your, your face. It's effortless to move around. You just push off uh, with your fingers in one direction and you'll keep going in that direction until something gets in your way. It's pure Newtonian motion. And uh, things like just typing on a keyboard to pressure that you put on your fingertips on the keys is enough to sort of propel you away from that. So you've got to think about how to manage all that. You know, eating and drinking are a lot of fun. Physiologically, there's a little bit of a sensation of fullness often, you congestion a little bit because the fluid that normally is pooled sort of in your lower extremities due to gravity doesn't have that force anymore. And so it tends to rise and you know fill your head Good news is your wrinkles go away. You grow a couple inches generally. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that all goes back to uh, baseline when you come home. But uh, for a while, it's pleasant. Hey, I'm getting on the next flight, Michael. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and um, how does it feel? And how did it feel? I mean, the, the number of times you've done it, but how does it feel coming back to Earth? It depends. It depends a lot on how long you've been gone. So my first three missions were about two weeks in duration each. And I would say that um, within hours, I felt quite functional. Um, they say that it's about a day for day on Earth upon return before you're 100% back to normal. And that seemed about right for a two-week mission. For a seven-month mission, which was my last one, it took me quite a bit longer, as you would expect. Um, by the end of that day, I could walk um, with my hand against a wall, you know, something to tell me which way it was vertical because your, your, your uh, inner um, ear system that gives you that balance sort of gets disconnected when you're in space and it takes a little bit of time for it to reconnect. And, you know, of course there's some weakness. Um, I don't know that it took seven months to get back to normal, but it takes some time. I also lost quite a bit of bone density which is a problem that I think we have overcome now with some countermeasures, which basically are exercise. Lifting uh, heavy weights with your back and your legs are what keep your spine, your skeletal system uh, active and therefore it doesn't atrophy as fast. But in my case, I'd lost about 12% of my bone density. And I think that led to sort of a feeling of weakness and fatigue that took quite a while to recover from. So is it like a, a sort of super jet lag really in some ways? <laughs> A little bit. It's not so much uh, fatigue uh, in terms of mental um, tiredness. It's more kind of a sense of things being heavy and, and kind of um, maybe like one feels when they have the flu or COVID, I guess, to actualize it, sort of a, a sensation of being tired all the time and um, physiologically more than mentally. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the super exciting mission you have uh, coming up this year. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Axiom Space and the AX1 mission? Of course, Axiom is a company founded uh, about five years ago, and our aim is to build the world's first commercial space station. So the ISS is a partnership with five agencies around the world, in addition to NASA, the European, Canadian, Japanese, and Russian space agencies. Uh, it is a incredible platform to do scientific experiments. Uh, it's been continuously inhabited since 2000. It's hosted thousands of experiments, people from 19 countries. And it's, it's an amazing vehicle, but it's a machine. And one day it's going to wear out and have to be brought down before the time that it becomes uncontrollable. And none of those five agencies have made any plans to build a follow-on station. However, they would still like to use um, the low earth orbit environment to continue to do the same kind of work that's being done today, which is human physiology experiments, physical science experiments, and technology demonstration. So the answer is a commercial space station where they can be a user, hopefully one of many users, um, and not have to pay the high price of maintaining the infrastructure. So we would do that. 
and we would charge them a service fee to come and, and use our facility. So instead of owning the hotel, they're just renting a room basically. Now our first module, which is already under construction in uh, Northern Italy will come to Houston to be integrated with the avionics and then it'll be launched sometime in late 2023. A second module will come about six months later and a third about six months after that. And all three of those will be attached to the existing International Space Station until such time it's decided by those governments to deorbit the ISS and then we would separate and become a free floating, free floating, free flying platform for commercial use. So that's what the company is about. AX-1 is a precursor mission, meaning we are taking three private astronauts. These are civilian, uh, all, all three of them are businessmen, one from the US, one from Canada, one from Israel, who are paying to go to space and also bring a suite of scientific experiments that they themselves will be doing. So they've teamed up with local organizations from their geographic regions to put together this complement. And so in some ways, it looks a lot like a government mission from a government astronaut, meaning it's mostly science, some educational outreach, et cetera. But the difference is it's being organized by a private company and funded by these private individuals. And, and we like this model. We think that there will be a demand for such flights in the future. So they become additional potential revenue customers uh, to the, the US government or all, all the governments that I mentioned, as well as private companies who may wanna do research, et cetera. So this is sort of one branch of revenue that we're exploiting. And at the same time, the five partner agencies get used to how Axiom operates. We've been working very closely with NASA, who is our, I guess you could call it sponsor. They're our, our entry into that five agency partnership. And uh, they have you know, very specific rules about who can go to the ISS. We've had to jump through all the same hoops as government astronauts. So it's really a, a very uh, rigid test case and so far so good. Michael, you spoke about the future of human space flight in your TED talk, which was in 2012. How does it feel like to be commanding the first private crew? And did you know back then when you did that talk that this was something you'd end up doing? In 2012, I left NASA, and as you mentioned, I went to work in Washington for the Commercial Space Flight Federation, and I had zero no, uh, knowledge of anything like this would develop. It was pure serendipity, and it's extraordinarily gratifying, as you can imagine, because I've been um, proselytizing about commercial human space flight since that time, and it was probably in 2018 or 19 when we decided that uh, we wanted to have a flown experienced commander of these private astronaut missions. And, you know, I was a person in the room that had had that experience. And so it sort of completely fell in my lap. But when I left NASA, I was quite content with my career and, and kind of, you know, was hanging up my cleats as we would say in a, an American football analogy. And um, this thing just came out of the blue and I'm very, very grateful and feel extraordinarily fortunate. Now, your son, uh, Nicholas, is currently working on a documentary film about your shared journey and the AX-1 mission. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. When I flew, my, he was not uh, born on my first mission. My second mission, he was a year old. My third, he was a three. And in my fourth, he, he actually turned seven while I was in orbit. I participated in his birthday party from uh, the ISS. So his relationship with that was fairly... Uh, I would say distant. He really didn't comprehend too much about what was going on. And, you know, having this thing happen and sort of now he's a, a young adult and interested in filmmaking and sort of resurrecting his, his roots, if you will, and, and really reconnecting with them and this whole idea. It's, for me, it's again, very gratifying because when he was young, he was, you know, he kind of passed on all of this thing. Most of his friends, parents were astronauts, and it just wasn't that interesting. And now that he's moved on, and, and his friends are now very excited, just like it's same for me, you know, when I was an astronaut, it was my life, you know, I, I, I lived it every day. And I, I hate to say it, we came routine, but it's your life and you become accustomed to it. When you leave, uh, and you start talking about it to other people, it becomes more and more precious and, and more special. 
And so the opportunity to go back and do it again is something that I feel like I'm going to appreciate this mission more than any of the previous four. And I think Nico, my son's uh, relationship with it is likewise. And does the film have a title yet? Working title is Alegria, which is my part of my last name, which means happiness. That's a great, that's a great, that's a great title, Michael. That's yeah, a great I, title. It's, uh, I've always appreciated that part of my last name and it's, you know, I don't know if it'll stick, but I, I like the uh, idea of it as a working title. Now I've had the, I've had the fortunate opportunity to meet you a number of times. Um, uh, and uh, you were very kind enough the last time I met you to record a short message for my uh, little niece, uh, who's just five years old, and uh, she loves space and she loves, uh, she loves, she can name all the plants. She know, probably knows more than I do about uh, space and the and and everything else. And and how does it feel to be uh, a person that can inspire youth and can talk about these stories and and you know maybe encourage these young kids to go up into go up into the skies and et cetera, et cetera. How does that feel? Oh, it's actually a responsibility. I think many of us are surprised when we get to NASA of the, by the attention that we get and, and we do wield uh, this sort of magic wand, which is quite powerful in terms of inspiring young people. And I, for one, am not a big fan of, you know, being popular or, or that sort of cultural icon sort of thing um, but at the same time you recognize that it's it's something that you know people look to you to do and so you take it seriously and I think it's uh, it's a wonderful um, ability to be able to influence people to to inspire them to you know work hard and pursue their dreams now when you look at the past present and future of the space industry um, are we where you thought we would be? And what else do you think is to come? Well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. In some ways, we're farther behind, and in others, we're farther ahead. So we're, I, I feel like, um, certainly as a kid who watched the, uh, the first steps on the moon, I would have thought that by now we would have a settlement there and be on to Mars. <clears throat> um, I didn't understand that that whole program was driven by geopolitical reasons and, and and, and, you know, the funding is very, very important. And without some sort of almost existential threat, it's very difficult to get the kind of budget that, that the NASA enjoyed back in that era. Um, however, in terms of commercial space, I think we're a bit ahead of where I thought. I mean, this idea of reusability, what Bezos is a uh, new shepherd and of course, Elon Musk's um, Falcon 9 can do reusing the first stage is just, it's a game changing. And that has revolutionized the launch business in mm -hmm. this country and in the world in terms of price. Um, I think this kind of innovation where, you know, there has to be capital behind it, but in terms of, you know, those two people obviously have a lot of money and, and passion for it. And they've directed it into, the, into this technology development um, but they are not encumbered by a lot of the government regulations and I'll say bureaucracy that encumbers NASA today. And, you know, NASA is not the agile agency it was in the 60s. It's a, a pretty big, you know, 18,000 people, um, 25 million a year um, budget agency that has a lot of rules and regulations. And so these young, nimble companies that are free from that kind of restriction are much quicker to innovate and to uh, develop their designs. So I, I think the commercial space sector is going to uh, be a fundamental part of exploration, both uh, human and, and satellites in the future. I'm sure for our younger listeners, they'd be interested in knowing what, what advice you would give them uh, sort of for aspiring astronauts, what advice would you give them going forward? Well, before I mentioned this idea of inspiring, you know, the youth to follow their dream. And for me, that's the advice is follow your dream. I, a lot of people say, what do I need to do to be an astronaut? Well, there's no university uh, curriculum called astronaut, right? Everybody comes to 
Sad, sadly not, sadly not, Michael, sadly not. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> so you study engineering or mathematics or some sort of scientific field, and then you excel at that field, and then it, you apply, and if you're lucky, you get chosen, but very, very few people get chosen. And so you better focus on what happens if I don't get chosen, and that is much better time. Your time will be much better spent doing something that you really care about first of all, or maybe secondly, and first of all, you'll do better at those things. So if something drives you, if you have a passion to do something, go do it. You'll excel at it. You'll give yourself the best chance to succeed in, in whatever, whether it's being an astronaut or, or being something completely different from that. I, I think the uh, secret is to really follow your heart. And in your view, this the, the, the next phase of the space race, will that be your Elon Musk's and your Bezos's of the world? Or will this be a change in the geopolitical situation on Earth. I mean, if if uh, if we we have more conflict or, or or disputes with Russia or China, do you think that's going to drive uh, the space race going forward, or do you think it's going to be more of a commercial proposition? I would bet on a commercial proposition. I think the space race of the 1960s was an aberration because of what we knew and really didn't know about space as a frontier. And it was seen as um, a proxy for domination. Now there is the real um, contest in space for domination to be able to own that battle space, if you will. But that isn't something that is going to cause countries to think that their future is in question. And if that doesn't motivate the governments, it won't motivate the populace to fund these things. And so I think we will pursue exploration on a scientific basis, which obviously has its own merits, um, and, and thankfully so, uh, not a geopolitical crisis. And I do think that there are potential um, areas of profit, because without some sort of profit, people won't do the things like put a lander on Mars, I'm talking about commercially. Um, but I do think that, that there are things out there both on other planetary, uh, other extraterrestrial bodies that to extract minerals, to extract uh, water, which can be used to make hydrogen and oxygen, which are fuel and, and obviously breathing gas. So all those kinds of things will over time propel technology to be developed. And I think the government in parallel and using some of those services, you know, leveraging those capabilities that the, the companies are bringing, which is happening today with commercial transportation to the ISS is now done by a couple of US companies, maybe soon to be three. Commercial human transportation is being done by SpaceX now, and we hope Boeing will come online soon. So this model, I think, is completely applicable for exploration of the of lunar orbit and lunar surface, and then you know one day beyond. Now, Michael, in our lifetime, will we have people living on the moon or Mars? Not Mars. I, I am skeptical that a human will set foot on Mars in my lifetime. Um, I am hopeful that we will have settlements settlements, outposts on Mars. I don't think people are going to be moving there, you know, with plans to not come back. I don't think we're going to colonize Mars anytime soon, but I think we will see people there, perhaps a little bit like the International Space Station as a laboratory, as an outpost, as a technology development site. Um, I think that's quite reasonable. Now, we know other than the AS-1 mission, mission, what's the future hold for you, Michael? We'll see. I'm very focused on this mission. I'm really having a great time training with my crew. It's been a pleasure to see how they've evolved. And they've, it's, it's a wonderful crew, very disparate personalities with a very singular focus. Um, each of them brings different assets to the table. That's been really gratifying. Um, there may be another mission for me in the future. We'll have to see how the things fall out, but it, certainly I will be involved with the company, both in the development of the space station from a you know, previous user standpoint, and also in the business development world, I want to keep fomenting this idea of a, of a growing economy in low Earth orbit that we can be a part of. Well, it's amazing. I hope that uh, once you've uh, had a successful mission, uh, you'll come back and tell us all about that experience. And, and we wish you all the very best for the mission later this year. Uh, and Michael, thank you so much for your time. It's really very much appreciated. 
It's been a pleasure, and I uh, will come back and tell you all about it, I promise. Thank you for that. I time. can't wait. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Michael. You've been listening to Metaverse with me, Francis Hellia. Thank you so much to my guest, Michael Lopez Alegria, for a great conversation. Tweet us at MetaversePod for any suggestions or feedback. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please do share a link on social media. You can sign up to receive an email when a new episode drops at our website, metaverse.fm.